while we're waiting, I would like to make take the opportunity to do some advertisement. Uh, but but I guess Marco, I should go ahead afterwards anyway, right? Or are we still waiting? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I think you can go away. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So tired, maybe tired. I know maybe. I should take the opportunity also first to thank everyone who's <laughs> coming today for the closing lecture. I know that um, it's always it's always the same experience. It's so much that everyone is exposed to at OPLSS that there's lots of excitement, but at the end of it, one is really drained. But that's a good sign. So it means it was worthwhile attending it. Anyway, so. I would like to make you aware of the programming language, uh, programming languages mentoring workshop. There are a series of those workshops that are co-located with all the big uh, conferences. So the one that is basically upcoming is uh, the mentoring workshop that is co-located with Popple. Popple is the conference uh, around programming languages and, and type theory and so forth. Uh, so uh, I will be co-organizing it, um, this upcoming uh, workshop together with Robert Krebers and Paul Downen and also Christine, now I forgot her last name, name I apologize. Uh, so what will you learn at the Programming Languages Mentoring Workshop? So basically the workshop consists of a series of talks given by uh, people in the field, so uh, researchers in the field uh, at different levels, so some senior people, some more junior people. Um, and the talks fall into two categories. One is research talk, so um, a professor will give a talk about their, their kind of research, but trying to really appeal and, and to, to intuitions and provide an introduction. And then there's also a series of graduate skills talks. So these can be talks about what are my strategies to survive in academia, or um, how do I define a good research project? How do, you, do I deal with, um, you know, uh, kind of obstacles in my way and so forth? Uh, so that can be quite personal. So people that we invite are really uh, free to choose a topic that they would feel comfortable to talk about. We also had in the past two years, we had people giving talks about mental health, uh, which were really great talks. Then we have usually two panels um, where we have panelists uh, that respond to questions. There are a couple of prepared questions, but there's also the opportunity uh, by the attendees of the workshop to post questions. And then we are also going to include uh, small mentoring sessions where we typically have uh, people from the community um, signing up as mentors. So the mentees can sign up to talk to a mentor for maybe about half an hour or an hour. We will have to figure exactly how to do that. Uh, so the big question will be in what form the conference will take place. I guess it's it's pretty likely that this is going to be the first in-person conference, but in any case, we're probably uh, trying to prepare for a hybrid mode, but no decisions have been made yet. Um, the most important thing is that if you want to attend, you have to apply for, the, for, for attending the workshop. And um, right now the, the website is not yet set up. So just monitor the website for details. Usually the application deadline is sometimes in November, depending also whether it's fully, whether it's fully online or there's a, a kind of a hybrid component or in-person component, then the deadline is sure around November. Uh, and just Google for Popple 2022, eventually the workshop website will be set up. Okay. Okay, so then with that, uh, I'm going to start the closing lecture of OPLSL 2021. OPLSS, I said it wrong. Uh, okay, so let me briefly recap what we talked about last time. So in the beginning, we added replication. So of course, the, the linear BAM to our intuitionistic linear uh, session type language. And then 
we basically added manifest sharing, which results in the language still sub S. Uh, so we worked out the basic ideas, uh, then uh, defined the type system and also the dynamics. Basically, we looked at the rules that we have to add. And what we concluded with is that given the ideas that we put in place, uh, sales of S guarantees session fidelity, but unfortunately no longer deadlock freedom. So we're basically losing out on something. And now in today's lecture, I will show you how we can use ideas from hybrid logic and basically superimpose model worlds on our typing judgment in order to uh, re-establish deadlock freedom. All right, so let's uh, start with that. Um, so I, I'll, I, I use lots of uh, figures again in order to appeal to, to intuition. Uh, it's, it's a more advanced topic. So unfortunately it's the last lecture and it's probably the most advanced topic, but um, I, I, I'll certainly make sure to, to bring across the main ideas. Okay, so just hang in there. Uh, so briefly, let's uh, remind ourselves what are the key ideas of manifest sharing in order to see basically then how everything fits, uh, fits smoothly together. Okay, so we saw that one of the basic ideas was to establish an acquire release discipline uh, at the type level. So to manifest that discipline in the type structure. And that basically requires us to first, before we can interact with the share process, we have to acquire it so that we get an exclusive linear channel to it. Then we interact along that linear channel, communicate along that linear channel uh, in isolation from all other clients. And then we release the process once we are done. And we also saw that another important ingredient is to establish a well-formed condition on the session type. Uh, which we refer to as equisynchronizing, which just makes sure that by the type definition, uh, that whenever we release a process, we have to release it back to the same type at which we previously acquired the process. Okay, so let's briefly again look at the Q session type. So in this setting, we would have to acquire the process uh, before we send an NQ or DQ label and then we release before we recurse. And as we can see, that's a perfectly equisynchronizing session type because we release back to the type Q at which we acquired the process. Okay, and then we saw that we basically can now manifest the acquire release discipline in the type structure. So here we have two layers, a, a shared layer here in, denoted in blue and a sh uh, oh, I said shared layer, linear layer in blue and a shared layer. And we have two adjoint modalities connecting the two layers. Um, and then basically given that, we also see that an upshift amounts to an acquire and the downshift amounts to a release. And really the takeaway message is the up arrow, as I said, is an acquire, the down arrow is a release. Okay. so. What we have now as a result of this, we have a session type system that allows us to have kind of linear and shared processes to, to coexist. And it guarantees data race freedom and also preservation. And as we have seen, we have even an implementation in ferrite. So ferrite really implements SIL sub S. And but as I started out with, and I pointed out last time, we no longer get deadlock freedom, unfortunately. Well, that's bad news, right? But there's also a little bit a silver lining about this because it tells us also something about the expressiveness of the language. So let me make an analogy. When we have the simply typed Lambda calculus, we can add recursive types to the simply type lambda calculus. And by doing that, we can recover the expressiveness of the untyped lambda calculus. And it actually holds true that the same is not the case for uh, basically a linear session type. So if we just add recursive types to the linear session types, we, we are not able to recover the expressiveness of the pi calculus. 
of the omtai pi calculus. So it turns out that in order to have the same expressiveness, we need both recursive types and also shared session types. And the reason for this is really because acquired release introduces non-determinism in the system. And we've actually proved that result in a paper. I'm citing it here at the bottom. And in this paper, we show how we can encode the untyped asynchronous pi calculus into the language still sub s. And then we also show give a proof of the of the operation and observe observational correspondence of between SILAS and the encoding. All right. So um, now we, I, I was just meaning to point that out because it's kind of important to see that, that basically because we have deadlocks or having the expressiveness actually of the pi calculus also means that we have deadlocks because we can have deadlocks in the pi calculus. So before launching into figuring out how to kind of curtail the type system in order to rule out deadlocks, you might wonder also what that means for the curry hover correspondence. Because like in lecture two, I showed you that there's a correspondence between linear logic session types and uh, the, sorry, linear logic and the session type pi calculus. So we saw in that lecture that we can view linear propositions as session types, proofs as processes, and cut reduction as communication. Well, now, of course, that breaks down, right, when we, uh, when we have manifest sharing. But still, we can uh, kind of show, or at least we can delimit where it breaks down, right? So even with manifest sharing, we still have a correspondence between linear propositions and session types, proofs as processes. However, then basically there, this is where it breaks down. So we no longer have cut reduction as communication because what we get instead is basically an interleaving of proof construction, which is the acquire, proof reduction, which is really the communication, and then proof deconstruction, which is the release. So as a result, basically, we can view deadlocks as a failure of proof construction. Okay, so now let me provide you an example uh, for deadlock that we can get in SIL sub s, all right? And one of the, you know, the examples for that is Dining Philosophers that Dijkstra basically introduced for that purpose, right? So what I would like you to make aware of is that we cannot express dining philosophers with just linear session types because precisely we need to have, we need to be able to kind of close the loop. So we have an arrangement of philosophers sitting an hour, around the table. And so we have to basically uh, close the loop um, in this circular setup. And just with linear, linear references, we can do that. All right. So let's look at some code. Uh, I'm here. I'm using here SIL S uh, um, uh, notation. Um, I think that I'm. Yeah, I actually changed the signature sli slightly. I went back to an older style of the syntax. Uh, but anyway, so let me briefly walk through it because I can do that now here because you understand SIL S syntax. Uh, so basically, we have two. Uh, process definition. So we have the thinking philosopher. So that's philosopher thinking. And you can see in the signature here, we're, we're basically did it the other way around. So this philosopher is just offering a type of session fill, which stands for philosopher, which is really not, we don't care. It's basically of type one. Okay. It's eventually terminating. And it has, takes two arguments of type S for it. I'll get to that in a minute. And then over here, we have the eating philosopher, which takes two arguments of type L, L fork. So basically we distinguish as we did with the Q where we distinguish the empty Q from the non-empty Q. Here we distinguish the thinking philosopher from the eating philosopher. Okay, so let's look at uh, the forks here. So here we have two mutually recursive session types. Um, 
One is out fork, which st stands for a linear fork. And the other one is S fork, which stands for a shared fork. So what does that signify? We can think of the shared fork as the fork being on the table, a way available for being picked up by one of the philosophers. And the linear fork, on the other hand, signifies a fork that is picked up by a philosopher. So it's currently held by a philosopher. And um, so what you can see is that basically a linear fork can be or must be released and then it continues as a shared fork and a shared fork on the other hand can be acquired and it recurses as a linear fork. So basically this L fork S fork just represents a resource that can be perpetually acquired and released. Okay, so now let's look at uh, closer at the code. As I pointed out earlier, so as we might expect, the thinking philosopher has access to two forks that are currently lying on the table. And one is on its left and one is on its right. Well, what it means basically is the, the, the philosopher will try to acquire the left fork first and then the right fork. So basically whatever is the first argument to that process call is the fork that the philosopher will acquire first and then the right one. And then when it has successfully picked up both forks, the philosopher will recurse as an eating philosopher. So of course the eating philosopher will have access to two linear forks because the philosopher was able to successfully acquire those forks and helps them, helps them in, in, his, in, in their hand. And then the eating philosopher eats. And then when it, once it's done uh, eating, it will release the right and the left fork, and then it will recur as a thinking philosopher. Okay, so quite simple, right? It's as we would expect it to be. Now let's consider the following uh, code that we write. So what we're going to do first is we are going to, essentially we're going to set the table for three philosophers, okay? So we're going to create three forks, which are F0, F1, and F2. And then we are going to spawn um, three thinking philosophers. But what is important now is basically uh, how we provide access, basically the arguments that we provide, right? So as you can see, philosopher zero will try to first pick up fork zero and then fork one. Philosopher one will pick up first fork one and then fork two and P2 will first pick up fork two and fork zero. All right, those of who you are familiar with the problem probably now realize, okay, I know what's going to happen, but let's look at a possible schedule when we run this program. A in a possible schedule, the philosopher zero could be able to acquire fork zero and philosopher one acquires fork one and philosopher two, fork two. Now we are in a deadlock state because philosopher zero now has to pick up next fork one, which is currently held by philosopher one. So philosopher zero is waiting for philosopher one to release fork one. But philosopher one, on the other hand, is waiting for philosopher two to release fork two. And philosopher two is waiting for the philosopher zero to release fork zero. So we have a now a deadlock because of a cyclic, a cyclic dependency between acquisitions. All right. Any questions up to here? Doesn't seem like it. All right. Good. So that's kind of the obvious example. Okay. And I have to tell you when I started working on this project, I thought this is what I have to consider. And I started developing the type system and then I started to phrase uh, the progress theorem and I realized, oh, I can't prove it. And I realized that I'm missing out on another possible deadlock, which is in hindsight, actually not surprising, but back then it was somewhat surprising to me at least. Okay, so let's consider another example. It's somewhat synthetic. So I have two processes an owner process and a contester process. So 
again, they have access to a shared resource. So think of S rays, so the shared resource as like the fork, the shared fork that we looked at earlier. So it's something that be, can, can be perpetually acquired and released. Okay. All right. So they both have access to that. And then in terms of the session offered by the owner, it's not really an interesting session. This guy just eventually terminates. Okay. Well, for the contester, it's more interesting because the contester too will eventually terminate, but before doing so, it will send the message ping along its offering channel. All right. So now you can see that actually when we are looking at this line over here, we can see that the owner is going to be the parent of the contester. So the owner is the one that spawns the contester and provides access to the shared resource. So it will send a shared channel, uh, it will provide a shared channel argument when it spawns the contester. Now let's look into the code further of the owner. Well, what is the owner going to do after it spawned the contester? The first thing it will do, it will try to acquire the shared resource. And then before releasing the shared resource, it waits for the contester so it cases on C, it waits for the contester to send it the message ping. Once it has received that message, it waits for the contester to terminate, then it releases the resource and then it terminates itself. On the other hand, what does the contester do? do? It too will first try to acquire the, the, the shared resource. Then it sends the message ping, after which it will release the, the shared resource and close. Now let's consider again a, a, a possible way of basically starting that program. So here we're starting the, we're spawning the shared resource and then we spawn the owner and give it access to the sh shared resource. Internally now the owner will now spawn the, the, the contester. So now let's imagine a schedule where the owner has, is able to acquire the shared resource. So now we are in a state where the contester will wait for the owner to release that shared resource because the contester is trying to acquire, but the owner won't release the resource before it has received the message ping from the contester. So the owner is waiting for the contester. Okay, so what is important here is we do not have a cyclic dependency because of kind of cyclic acquires, but here we have a deadlock due to interdependent acquisitions and synchronizations. So with synchronization, I mean like waiting for a message exchange. Okay, so I would like to point out that this deadlock occurs even when we have an asynchronous semantics or can occur even if we have asynchronous semantics for the language. All right. Okay, so those two examples are quite idiomatic because they show us kind of what is the space that we have to explore and account for when we want to attract uh, when, when when we want to guarantee deadlock freedom. All right. So in order to help us find the right abstractions to reason about deadlock freedom. It is helpful to remind us first why in linear logic session types uh, we actually do not have deadlocks. And I showed you that picture earlier, but let me remind you of that picture. Okay, so what we know from the lecture so far is that linearity guarantees uh, us that there exists exactly one client. And then as a result, the runtime structure that we get. So the configuration of processes actually form a tree. So I'm visualizing this here again. And here I use gray uh, just to denote the linear processes, okay? But we can see that the parent node actually becomes a client in our intuitionistic worldview and the child node is the provider. Okay, and at the time 
we noted that even in this setting, there are potential threats to deadlock, uh, to progress, because it is not the case that at every point in time, every process will be able to take a computation step because we have message exchange. So processes might be waiting for each other to synchronize. So we said at the time, there are two possible scenarios. One is where the provider is ready to synchronize, but the client is not. And the other one is where the client is ready to synchronize and the provider is not. And back then I said, let's visualize this waiting dependency with a green arrow in the runtime structure that we get, okay? And so I'm now drawing a green arrow from A to B if A is waiting for B to synchronize with it. So if we now draw those green arrows in our configuration that we currently have, we know because they're synchronization dependencies, they can always ever go along the edge in, in the tree structure. And there's no way for us to form a cycle only by going along the edges in the tree because it's a tree. And if the client and the provider are both waiting for each other, they don't have to wait, they can go ahead and communicate. Okay. So, um, something I wanted to point out is that those green arrows are really, you can think of them like, these are runtime abstractions, okay? So what I'm building up to is, if we want to prove deadlock freedom, we have to basically, we, we formalize, we capture formally um, our, the, how computation, what computation does from one step to the next. So it takes one configuration to the next one, and the waiting dependencies are highly dynamic. So with every step in the computation, the waiting dependency can change. So what I want you to understand is that basically when our program runs for every state, we get a, a new tree and possibly new green arrows popping up, okay? And we use those arrows as a conceptual model in our proof of progress in order to reason about what we want to prove at the end of the day once we add in share sharing we have to add in some other errors which we'll get to but my point is that at the end of the day in our proof we will show we have to prove that there's no way ever that we can close a cycle that we can form a cycle just using those arrows that denote waiting dependencies Okay, so that's where we're heading. Uh, any questions up to here? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so I'll just move forward. All right. So let's now make a mess and add sharing. Okay, and we know now that we basically have references, shared references going across the board. Okay. So what we really get is something like this, all right? It's chaos. Uh, by the way, so here I'm denoting the processes that are currently at their shared mo mode in red and the ones that are currently at their linear mode in blue. So I'm consistent with uh, like last, last uh, yesterday's lecture. What I did change though is now for the shared channels, I use black just because I need some, I need red later on, okay? So, but again, let's, let us remind us, uh, let's remind us of what's going on here. So essentially we have a bunch of processes and a process can always be at one of two modes, either it's shared or it's blue. When it's blue, it is, has a linear connection, a linear channel to another blue process, right? meaning that it's kind of part, that it's part of the tree structure that arises from linearity. So as a result of this, we can see that basically there's, there is chaos overall, but still there is some orderness that we can find in, in, in this 
uh, graph structure. Namely, what we'll see is that there's always one linear tree that is embedded in this graph. The other thing I want you to notice is that we, we have really those shared references going across the board. So in particular, we can have self loops and we can have connections between a node in the graph, in the tree, to a shared node outside the tree. Uh, also, the sh shared, shared processes can actually have a shared channel reference to a process that is currently linear, and so forth. Okay. So, are, are everyone's good with, with that kind of presentation? It's important to understand this. Okay, Tuta seems <laughs> tells me basically it's the case, so so I'll I'll go on. All right. So the good news is because we have a linear tree embedded in in this graph, it suffices for to reason about deadlock. We can all reason about it just in terms of this tree structure. So we basically can forget about those shared processes and we have just have to make sure that the, the blue processes behave properly. Okay, so let's now derive the full picture. What are the weighting dependencies that we can get in a system with sharing? Well, we do know that if we add a quiet release, it basically amounts to a locking, right? So we do know that we have the possibility of cyclic dependencies. Be, and now let's visualize this dependency, that the dependency basically that arises, so the weighting dependency that arises uh, by virtue of the locking, all right? So now we're going to visualize this with a different arrow. I'm using a red arrow, but I want to point out that I'm using a different arrowhead as opposed to the green arrow that we had before. So this is a solid arrowhead, the other one is not. Okay, so now I'm going to draw this arrow. I'm going to connect two nodes, a node A with a node B. If A waits for B to release a resource. So A has a shared reference to a process that is currently at its linear mode and is held by B. So A is waiting for B to release it. Okay, so now let's draw some arrows, uh, possible arrows that can amount in this uh, process graph structure that we have on the left. So for example, we can see that A has acquired C, it's a, it's a child of A, but B also has a shared reference to C. So B could be trying to acquire C. So B is waiting for A to release C. Well, but A on the other hand can also be waiting for D to release the resource G that A is trying to acquire. And D can be waiting for B because D is trying to acquire E, which is currently held by B. Okay. So as you can see now, we can actually form a cycle just consisting of those red arrows because those red arrows can connect arbitrary nodes in the tree. And that's if it cut precisely because those dotted arrows here, the shared channel references can go across the board. Okay, so now let's put the two things together. So we have the green arrows that are due to synchronization dependencies. And we have the red arrows that are due to uh, the locking. So that means we can- Stephanie, do you mind uh, going back one slide? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a question on, I guess, why we can ignore shared processes. Mm -hmm. So maybe you a can very show the animation yeah. before, yeah. Right. So, okay, so the, the reason being, I actually don't even have to go back. I can explain it on this slide. The reason is because how I phrase the red arrow dependency. I'm actually phrasing it between two linear 
two linear uh, processes and not a linear one and a shared one. I could phrase it as a process is waiting to acquire another process. And then I would, which is, an, is, is kind of a shared one. And then I would need to know that the shared one is currently basically held by a linear process, okay? So the reason why I can ignore the shared processes here is because I'm phrasing the waiting dependency between the process, the linear process that wants to acquire a shared process and the, the other process that is currently the owner of that shared process. Okay, so that, that's my answer. So it's actually, I think, a neat way of expressing it to, to, to it's, it's always, you know, at the end of the day, it's always about finding the right abstraction. And in this setting, what, what I was trying to do is basically leave sharing as much as possible unrestricted, but just uh, maintain some sanity when it comes to the linear processes. Okay, thanks for that question. So let me move on and point out that we now have two ways of creating cycles because we have two waiting to waiting dependency arrows, right? We have the green arrow, the one with the open arrowhead, and the red arrow, the one with the solid arrowhead, where the green arrow means that if it's if it's it's connecting a node A to a node B, it means A waits to synchronize with B. And otherwise, if it connects a node A with a connect uh, with a node B, it means A waits for B to release a resource. Okay. So as we saw earlier, because red arrows can connect arbitrary nodes in the linear tree, we can just form a cyc cyclic dependency just consisting uh, out of red arrows. And we saw that we can not do the same thing just with only green arrows. But unfortunately, we can find this combination, right? We can basically build any combination of green and red arrows, we have to have at least basically one uh, suited red arrow in order to close, form a cycle consisting otherwise of green arrows. And just to remind you, so this one was the example, the dining philosopher's example. And this thing here is the uh, owner and contester example. Okay, so a cycle to, 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 to say that once again, consists of red arrows only or a combination of red and green arrows. And it's precisely because of this scenario here that just employing basically Dijkstra solution of imposing a partial order on the resources and making sure that the, the, the resources are acquired in the order in, in the order prescribed by the order is not sufficient. All right. So we need more because we have to also rule out those guys and they are tricky. Okay. Let me go to the next thing. Well, again, as always, having the right intuitions using the right abstractions um, helps. So I think there is a basic truth <laughs> that, well, it's when we when we do real 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 world programs when we, we implement them, there always will be like um, it's it, it's never like just a, a rosy picture, right? So it's a fact of life that there will be competitors and collaborators. So what do I mean by, by this? So if we look at our process graph, there will be some processes that actually compete for a set of resources. So they're trying to acquire the same resources. And I'm calling those processes competitors. And, but we'll also note certain processes existing in the process graph that just happily hum, hum along, right? They're not getting into each other's way. So when we now look at 
how respond processes and in particular at how what happens in the tree structure that we're getting in the linear tree uh, when we acquire a process that we have actually a naturally arising formation so consider that when we acquire a process it becomes our child in the linear tree right so that tells us a natural way to align uh, processes is such that collaborators must be in a parent-child relationship and competitors are siblings. Okay, so when we now take this intuition, then we can take this to enforce the following high level invariants. Okay, so the first high level invariant would be that we have to make sure, in order to rule out the red arrow only cycles, that competitors employ a locking up strategy for the resources that they compete for. Okay, so we have to impose an order on resources, and whenever competitors try to acquire those resources, they have to go according to the order. Otherwise, we run into the red, the dining philosopher's problem. Okay, but then in addition, we have to make sure that collaborators are really collaborators, right? So they are actually acquiring mutually disjoint set of resources. Okay, so parent children have to be, they can only, in a parent-child relationship if they're not competing with each other. And then we have to make sure in order that everyone is happy at the end of the day, we have to make sure that competitors release all acquired resources before they basically synchronize with each other, which means they synchronize towards the root. Okay, so in summary, as I said earlier, rule A rules out red arrow only cycles and rules B and C rule out combinations of green and red arrow cycles. Okay, so that's now the high level intuition. So now let's see how we can take that intuition and make it manifest in, in a type in the type system. So, are there any questions so far? Uh, yes, there's one. Uh, there are two actually. One okay. is how does one find out that this is what's required? Where this probably refers to the three rules. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question, and I can only tell you by painful examination and playing with the problem and trying to phrase this type system, trying to to prove it, and then failing, and then go back and do over and you basically you go by iterative deepening you explore the problem uh, deeply enough in order to find then at the end of the day the invariance that you need but another uh, point that i would like to make is that um, this requires you to think about runtime structures so we can no longer just think in terms of logic inference rules. Because what we're going to do is, so we, we have to understand how the code behaves at runtime. What are the runtime structures? And then we have to distill the good invariants that we want to hold. And then we can kind of backpedal that into the type system. And there, that's where, in order to, to phrase those things properly, you need, you take inspiration from curry Haver correspondence from, from logic. And so it goes kind of hand in hand, but you, you have like this phase where you really have to understand how things behave, because this is, that's why I made a point of saying that this is effectful computation. Okay, so let me now show you how we can use, you know, uh, ideas from logic in order to kind of capture those ideas that we worked out together 
So what we are going to do is we're going to use possible worlds. And all right, so you can just think of a possible world as basically an abstract value that is constrained. And here in this particular case, we're going to kind of equip it with a partial order, all right? And then we do the following. We said, all right, now with every process that we have in our configuration, we associate a, a, such a possible world with it. And we also make sure that once the process is spawned, it's spawned at a particular world and it stays there. It cannot change its world. That's a good invariant to enforce. Otherwise, there's too much changing, all right? And now we use two other possible worlds to indicate for a process what is the range of processes it can acquire. So note that every process resides as a world. So we can indicate a min and a max world in order to indicate a range of worlds a process can acquire, all right? So the, the, with those two ideas, we can phrase the following judgments. So again, we, you will recognize here the judgments that we had in manifest sharing. So basically just disregard that part and that part here in brackets and you get the judgment for manifest sharing and also disregard this phi context here, okay. So how do we read that judgment? Basically it says process P provides a session of tape type A. So here it is a shared type A sub S. Here's a linear type A sub L along channel X using the channels in gamma and phi and delta. All right, so far so good. Also, if you want to learn more about this, you can read it, uh, read up on it in, in our paper. So there's one know. more. Oh, uh, sure, small go question. ahead. Um, yeah. Are these proofs of the type system made in a proof assistant, like, like COC, for example? Um, no, that this paper, it's a, it's, a, it's a pen and paper proof. So it's all um, uh, typed up in LaTeX. Uh, that being said, I'm currently working. So, so the issue is really COC. Uh, so here we're dealing in a substructural logic, and that's quite painful in COC. So right now I'm collaborating with Jules Jacobs and Robert Krebers, where we are actually developing a log logic for deadlock freedom in COC and we use concurrent separation logic for it. However, it's so far only for a linear type system. So uh, the long ter term goal is to kind of, uh, kind of uh, extend it to support uh, also sharing. All right. Okay, so now let me uh, provide you more details on those annotations here. So basically here we have, we associate with every process three worlds. I refer to it as the self world, the max and the min. So as you can already guess from the names, the self world is the world at which the process resides. So as I said, every process invariantly resides as a world, all right? And now basically the min and the max these indicate the, the range of processes and their worlds that the, the process can acquire, okay? So the main world would be the, the, the world of the minimal resource that can be acquired, and the max world is the world of the maximal resource that can be acquired. And because it's a partial order, we can just indicate the min and the max and we get the entire range. All right. So then we type check everything relative to this context psi. Yeah, I forgot to point that out earlier. So that's also something that we add. Where here the context psi, basically it's the partial order. Think of it as a partial order. There are some technical details, but it's the order. Then I also want to point out that here we have basically the linear context is delta, but we also have another linear, linear context phi. Um, so what we're doing is we're separating those linear channels that can be aliased, meaning they might have a shared reference. So the process offering on that linear channel might have a shared reference pointing to it. 
So we separate those processes from those which are in delta that cannot have any incoming shared references. And we know this because once we acquire something, basically we put it into this context because we acquired it uh, uh, using a shared reference. Whereas when we spawn a linear process, we know that there are no shared references yet. Okay, so now let's express our invariants, the high level invariants that we worked out together before A, B and C in terms of these judgments, judgments and using the worlds. Okay, so one invariant that we want to make sure is the following. It says that basically by typing, we have to ensure that the world of any process that we acquire has to be within the range indica indicated by the parent. So it has, between, be, has to be between the min of the parent and the max of the parent. And then the second invariant is that the max of the parent has to be less than the min of the child. So that ensures that the parent and the child are not competitors with each other. Okay, so now those two invariants together will rule out any vertically, vertically going red arrows. Okay, so then we need to make sure that an inquirer locks up. This will rule out any red arrow only cycles. And then lastly, we have to make sure that, as I said, that competitors give each other turn, which we can enforce by making sure that before a competitor tries to synchronize with its parent, it has to priorly release any resources it acquired. So that can be easily established by making sure that the right rules have an empty file context. So where we put in all the resources that we acquired. And this last invariant makes sure that we have not, nothing like this, where we have basically a horizontal ingoing red arrow and a green arrow going up. Okay. So now we build a type system that enforces these invariants. Okay, so now if you have some steam left, I can show you a few typing rules just to give you some ideas. All right, so what we have in the system is we have typing rules that allow us to create worlds and also establish an order between those worlds. And uh, you know, I've worked on type systems that use possible worlds already on various ones. And it really depends on the problem that you're targeting. Not in every case do you need to have the possibility to actually create worlds. You can also, for example, there's some recent work on information flow control in session type systems. There we don't need that property because the security lattice, which you can think of like the partial order, is predetermined, so we don't have to create it at runtime. However, here for deadlock, we need it because uh, that allows us to set up like a table for the dining philosopher and basically create those processes and assign uh, worlds to them. All right, so basically what I want you to note here is what does this typing rule says? Say we create here a world and then in the continuation, we have this world here available. So that is needed for us in order then to set up an order. So here basically we, are, we, we have in our order context, we, uh, we have, um, sorry, here, that's the thing I want to point out. We have two worlds, WP and WR, and now we are going to extend our order with a connection between the two. But we have to make sure that if we add this and we compute the transitive closure, over over the this graph, this the the, the remaining graph res, uh, is still irreflexive because we don't want to introduce any cycles in the order. So I have to make sure that it's still a partial order. Okay. So what is the typing rule for the acquire? Okay. So that's the most horrid typing rule. So uh, in a sense, it's not 
not really clever of me. If I want to sell you the type system, I show you the most horrid rule, but it's also honest, okay? And this is where the, all the action is. Okay, so what's going on here? So we are a client that is trying to acquire channel X sub S, and then if it's successful, it gets back an X sub L. All right, so we can see that in our gamma, we have a channel or channel variable X sub S that is of an acquirable type, and it has those annotations. All right, so let's look at it. All right, so we said that we have to establish the locking up strategy, right? So we have to go up in the order. So, well, what does this premise tell us? Well, we look at all the resources that we have already acquired that are in the context phi. And we look at the self world of those resources and we now require that for all the resources we already have that have to be less than the self world um, than uh, of the resource that we're trying to acquire now. So that guarantees locking up. Okay, so next premise. Well, one invariant was that we have to make sure that actually the thing that we're acquiring is indeed in the range that we're indicating, right? So the resource that we are acquiring is at omega sub m. And the range that we're indicating is omega k bis om b, uh, to omega n. So we require that omega m is in between that range. So we're good. Now we also have to make sure that we can transitive reasoning and make sure that um, a parent is not competing with any of its transitive children. So for this, we have to make sure that the parent, uh, sorry, the max world of the parent, which is here omega n, is less than the mean world of the child, and the mean world of the child is omega u. Okay. Uh, right, I think then I basically, so yeah, what I think I wanted to show here is now that once we have acquired the resource, we're putting it into the phi context. So no, we're not putting it into delta, but we, we put it in the phi context. Okay, so now let's look at the right rule for the acquire, so the accept rule. Well, this is really totally um, as expected and unchanged. The only thing that I point out is here that we insist that phi must be empty, but that's the same thing as insisting that delta has to be empty that we already had in manifest sharing because phi is just another linear context. Okay, so now you might wonder about the remaining typing rules. And I can refer you to the paper, but let me point out that really they are largely unchanged. They're really the ones that you see in the system still as so the manifest sharing set, uh, system with the with the difference that all the right rules require the phi to be empty and that's precisely because we want to make sure that the competitors give each other turn all right and then also the spawn rule is another quite involved rule because when we spawn another process, we have to again uh, establish the invariance. So when, a, when, a, when we spawn another process, we have to, for example, make sure that this process that becomes our child is not a competitor with us and things like that. So another important thing I want to point out is that the type system is compositional as one expects from a type system. And we can do this by basically having polymorphic, so world polymorphic process definitions. So that's analogous to ML polymorphism. So a process definition, like in ML, you have like lambdas are polymorphic, right, in the types. So here processes are polymorphic in the worlds. So that means that every process definition specifies a local process order and then when we spawn a process, the spawner has to instantiate those world variables. And the order, there's the constraint that 
the order of the spawner must entail the order of the spawning. All right. So let's circle back to our second example that we looked at, uh, at which gave rise to a green arrow, red arrow cycle. So a combination. So that was the owner and the contester. So here I'm showing the same example. I just arranged it on top of each other because I'm now needing space also for the world annotations. So everything in red is what we've added now. And let me briefly walk you through that. So here, as I said earlier, when we define a process, we indicate a local order. So here I'm using now the deltas because these denote the world variables that are going to be substituted on, on spawning, okay, upon spawning. So I'm, I just can use names. So these, these are locally bound. And so what I'm saying is basically I'm type checking this process definition under the order delta zero is less than delta one is less than delta two. And then we also associate with the offering channel here, those worlds. So indicating that the offering process is at world delta zero and it's going or it's allowed to acquire a resource that is at world delta one. So the min and the max is delta one. So we just can um, acquire something at delta one. And then we see that we have an argument that actually resides at world delta one and it can possibly acquire something at world delta two. All right, then let's look at the contester. The contester here is also type checked to a relative uh, order, local order, that is delta zero, delta one and delta two. Please note, I could have used delta four, delta 17, delta whatever, all right? So it's just coincidence because I use like a schematic way of setting things up, but those, this delta zero is not the delta zero here, right? These are variables that are locally bound, all right? So then we can see that the, the, this process offers the internal choice thing and then termination, and it's residing itself at world delta zero. And it's again given access to a shared resource at world delta one. And indicating also here that it's allowed to acquire something at world delta one, all right? And now, here you can see the spawning and how we kind of put the things together. Now, when we spawn the contester, we now have to instantiate the variables of the process that we are spawning. And we just happen to instantiate them. We instantiate them with the worlds that we have around here, but actually also we're dealing only with world variables here because we're in a process definition. But we're instantiating it such that the the contester will reside at the same world that we are residing. And it also happens to be able to acquire the same resources that we are allowed to acquire. Well, now you can already see, right? This program won't type check. And the places where it will flag an error are the highlighted ones. So in this case, it won't type check We're, because we are spawning a process that is not a collaborator because it, it, it basically um, is trying to acquire the same range of resources that we are trying to acquire. So it's a competitor. We're not allowed to, to spawn that as a child, but it has to be basically a child of our parents so that it's, it's becoming a sibling. And then also down here, this won't type check because here we are trying to communicate to our parent. So it's a right rule. We're talking up to, to our parent and all the right rules require that, um, that we have released all resources, but we can see that that's not the case because we have previously acquired the resource when we execute this and then we release it. So just this part would be fine if we were to move the message ping uh, past. Okay, so I'm actually good in time because my plan was not to consume the entire one hour and 20 minutes because it's anyway the last lecture, okay? So 
let me uh, summarize. So what have we achieved? We have now a type system that guarantees deadlock freedom by type checking. And it's true that we can type interesting uh, uh, examples. So for example, there's dining philosopher, there's also an imperative queue where we actually have pointers to the front and the back of the queue so that we don't have to do the thing where we basically pass down an end queue down the list. And um, right, so my experience is really that you just have to phrase the program slightly differently, but there's a one limitation I'm aware of, which is the so-called unbounded circular process network. That was a um, kind of term that was, I think, phrased by um, Kobayashi. Uh, so what is the idea? Well, let's consider dining philosopher. So in SIL, as, SIL sub S plus, which is the deadlock freedom free version, we can write any basically a dining philosopher or we can set the table for any number of philosophers and forks provided that they're statically known the number is statically known so we basically just hard code a program but what we can do is have basically write a looping or a recursive process that sets the table that uh, spawns and processes where the n is determined at runtime. The reason for this is that right now our worlds can only propagate in a forward fashion. So when we spawn a process, we provide arguments and we basically instantiate the spawnee with worlds. But right now there's no way for us to kind of have the worlds flow, flow back. So for this, we would have to just add first class world support so that we can communicate worlds also. And I'm pretty sure we can, can do it then that way, but I haven't explored it any further. It also complicates the type system more. Another interesting question is of course, world inference, because whereas we want to have, you know, programmers write session types because they indicate the protocols, it would be pretty tedious to, to write down those worlds. Um, I haven't explored it any further, but my current understanding is that it's relatively straightforward because when we spawn something or when we acquire something, these are the places where the constraints are generated. Okay, so and with this, I'll get to the end or oh, question mark. I don't know. Maybe it's a new beginning for you. Maybe I um, was able to spark some excitement for session types. Um, that would be wonderful and uh, feel free to reach out to me in case you have any questions I'm, I'm happy to answer emails uh, what I did for you for those who are interested in exploring further I have like three slides with some kind of I guess key papers that I haven't mentioned otherwise during the talk however by no means it is this a comprehensive list all right so I basically sorted it by like the original session types work and also work on multi-party session types. And in all cases, I always try to kind of provide the seminal papers and then you get an idea of the people, right? Then you know who to Google for if you want to find out more. So there's definitely Koei Honda, then his wife, uh, Nobuko, Nobi, Nobuko Yoshida, uh, and who is now, uh, a very important person in the session type community and and has had so many contributions and is contributing still so that's you know a, a few works that i can cite then in the i try to categorize them uh, according to intuitionistic linear logic session types again the seminal papers and just again a few authors um, then we have like classical linear logic session types I also want to point out two papers and actually I believe that Cezanne is also a participant here at the Oregon Programming Language Summer School. So these are two papers who still are in the Corey Howard correspondence, but provide some form of sharing, not the same unbounded almost expressiveness as in sales of S, but very interesting works to look uh, to look at too. Uh, then I have some various 
other ones like, for example, uh, session types have e even been used uh, to, to, to kind of build a language for dig digital contracts. Here I have a latest work by myself and Farzani Derakshan and Liminja on non-interference. Uh, then just if you wonder, how can I find papers? Maybe you already know, but if you don't know, there's this, there's this database, CBLP. This is a very solid uh, resource. I provide here the link. Uh, basically any good uh, venue, scientific venue, and publications that result from it will have a record in DBLP. What you can also use is Google Scholar, but you get much more things. Uh, the reason why I point out Google Scholar is because it's a good way of basically doing time travel. So if you have a seminal paper, you can enter it in Google Scholar, and then you can see who else cites that paper. And that's how you can basically travel forward in time to, to see maybe even newer research on that topic. Okay, so and with that, I'll, I'll close unless there are more questions. All right, oops. Um, should, should I read any questions? If, oh, yeah, actually I can. Okay, uh, the latest one is by Prasang. By, okay. Uh, no, that was the one that was already earlier, right? How do I identify the required invariants, right? Or is uh, there another one? I'm talking about the most recent comment. I'll read it. Uh, could you oh, explain wait a the... minute. I have to scroll down. Ah, I see. Okay, yeah, so how, what's the intuition for the worlds? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there, I mean, it's a known concept, as I said, there's uh, from hybrid logic, and there was a, at the time, not yet published paper, where they use a kind of hybrid logic worlds for some reachability. And um, I think that's the paper that inspired me to explore worlds. Uh, I also tried to use at some point kind of a, an adjoint formulation, but that doesn't really work because they, I haven't explored it any further, but you, you cannot, it doesn't really make sense to create an unbounded amount of adjoint layers. So, um, and then to be honest, once you use it, you see worlds anywhere or everywhere, I should say. Uh, so I used it also for this non-interference, so the information flow control type system, and it's a very powerful method. And I think actually, so it actually relates to cryptological relations. Um, so the worlds are cryptological relations. When you look, for example, at IRIS, uh, the whole methodology they rely on, they use very powerful logical relations to reason about their programs. And as soon as you need to reason about state, you use cryptological relations. And cryptological relations use um, possible worlds. And in a sense, uh, what we're doing here in those type systems is we kind of um, internalize the possible worlds into the type structure, whereas in cryptological worlds, you externalize them. So it's kind of an interesting um, uh, kind of parallel development. I, I think that you gain something by, it, it seems like when you internalize it in a type system, you get a lighter uh, formalization or a lighter approach. Uh, however, also you're like uh, the, the iris tool chain and doing it that way has the advantage that it's kind of compositional. They have this library approach so you can possibly use an existing library and extend it. So as always, there's no free lunch. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, so then, uh, seems happy. <laughs> All right. Then on behalf of uh, all the organizer, uh, Stephanie, I okay. thank you for uh, giving these uh, wonderful lectures. Thank they you. were uh, <laughs> very interesting. And I'm sure also students have uh, appreciated uh, much. Uh, this was uh, not your first time at OPLSS, but a different time uh, because of uh, the 
format belle we hope all to see you soon again yeah i hope i hope so too. It's really a pleasure to to teach at OPSS. it's a lot of work but it's it's a pleasure it's a, such a great place and i should also add that i attended ops as, as a student myself as a postdoc so it's kind of closing the circle thank you great oh that's wonderful uh, can you hear me yeah um, yes we can i can hear. yes i don't know oh, exactly hi. who's talking hi i'm trying hi. so to try to find your video <laughs> oh sorry I, I don't have the video on. oh okay no worries okay then i'm just listening no worries <laughs> uh, so i i just wanted to say thank you on on behalf of all the participants for an excellent uh series of lectures thank uh, you. i think we we learned a great deal about the uh, session types both theoretically like in linear logic and as well as um some cool applications and i think the slides were really nice and the diagrams were helpful um the examples with the queue uh, in SIL were also really informative, and it was really nice having those handouts too to refer to. So Good, overall, I think um, these lectures sort of um, really inspired me to want to learn more about Ooh. session types. So I just want to say uh, thank you again. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And uh, the best thing is if, if I could inspire some, some interest in session types. So thanks a lot. It was my pleasure.